Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Pratima Gupta, and I am a new board member with Close the Gap California. Thank you all so much for joining us. I do want to acknowledge our current COVID-19 pandemic that I know we all are enduring in various ways. Um, it's having impact on all of us, but I think as we were discussing, this is one of the highest interests we've had in any of our webinars, and it really demonstrates the need for good leadership and having women at the table to discuss sort of and plan um, the next steps. So I want to um, welcome our esteemed participants to our Close the Gap California webinar um, from nonpartisan office to partisan progressive candidates. Um, today we have Amber Barish Power, our, who's the executive director of United Food and Commercial Workers. She's worked in labor and politics and plays a pivotal role with pivotal candidates role. and legislators. We also have um, the Honorable Jane Kim, former San Francisco supervisor. Um, she um, was a 2016 very competitive race for state senate and has continued to be a stalwart to San Francisco um, ally and legislator and mentor to many individuals. We have Johanna Silva-Wacki, who's our West Coast State and Local Regional Director for EMILY's List. Um, and all of our current panelists use the pronouns of she, her, and hers, um, and, as do myself. And I also wanted to just give you all a little bit on the basics of Close the Gap California. So Close the Gap California is a statewide campaign that was launched in 2013 to close the gender gap in the California legislature once and for all. So our goal is to recruit accomplished progressive women, in, such as you all, in targeted districts and prepare them to launch competitive campaigns. Close the Gap is really changing the face of the legislator one cycle at a time. And in fact, um, fun fact is that nine Close the Gap California recruits are serving today. Eight of them are actually women of color. So our recruits are truly committed to the issues that we care about um, as women and as Californians, including reproductive justice, public school funding, and combating poverty. Um, so our main thing you know, now is that we are planning for a 2028. In the last two years, the percentage of women serving in Sacramento has surged from a 20-year low of 21% to an all-time high of 32%. Now that's thanks in large part to all of the work that we all are doing here at Close the Gap and the recruiting strategy and our allies, such as you all, throughout the state. In the 2020 cycle, also, there were six of our recruits that have advanced the November runoff rates in key legislative races up and down the state. But the real golden opportunity that we have is to reach 50% gender parity for women, which lies in the next four election cycles, so 2022 to 2028. And we're calling these 90 plus, as you can see on this slide here, this jump of this 96 plus per seat that will be open during the time period is our mother load. And that's an intended pun. So um, if, um, in terms of just the format of the webinar, I just wanted to so each of our panelists is going to kind of introduce themselves and her experience more in depth. And for about five minutes, um, we'll give a talk. Then we'll transition to a couple of minutes of questions. Please, I encourage you all participants, please submit questions through the chat function. Um, and we'll address as many of those as we can. And then we'll wrap up with a final kind of general Q&A. Um, and we'll try and get to as many of your questions as we can. Great. So. Um, we're going to start off our panel here with Johanna. We'll uh, give you a little bit more about her background, her experience, and we'll go from there. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Pratima. And thank you to Close the Gap California for including Emily's List on the panel. Um, for those who may not be familiar with Emily's List, we are the largest resource for women in politics. I always get asked if um, we're named after an Emily, and we are not. Our name is an acronym that stands for Early Money is Like Yeast. It makes the dough rise. When we were founded in 1986, no woman had been elected to the U.S. Senate in her own right. Since then, we've been instrumental in helping thousands of pro-choice Democratic women run and win campaigns at every level of office. I've been with Emily's List for almost five years. The focus of my work has been on recruiting, training, and advising women in various parts of the Western region to help flip legislative chambers in states like Colorado, New Mexico, and Nevada. 
my work now in California is focused on increasing the number of pro-choice Democratic women in the state legislature and building a pipeline of female candidates. This discussion couldn't be more timely because as we've seen in the past few weeks, many local leaders are at the front line of leading their communities during this crisis. And it reminds us how important it is to build a, a pipeline of candidates. As we start having conversations about how our communities are going to recover from the pandemic, we must think about the leaders we want in office. Just in the recent few weeks, we've seen attacks from the right to eliminate health care, specifically reproductive health care, which continues to marginalize people, especially women. Uh, as, that was, is, as it was mentioned in California alone, we will have uh, 90 seats up in the state legislature in the next few cycles. So it's imperative that we identify and support local rising stars who are leading in their communities and can lead California for many years to come. Since 2016, uh, EMILY's List has had over 50,000 women sign up to be part of our Run to Win program, which is our national recruitment and training campaign focused on helping pro-choice Democratic women uh, around the country run for office and win. So in politics, we know that timing is everything. When I talk to candidates about their interest in running for higher office, I always advise them to think through how they can utilize their current uh, leadership position to build their profile and expand their network. We always encourage candidates that if they want to run for office to make that decision early. There's no doubt that making an early decision to run gives you an advantage. It allows you the opportunity to raise early money and build early support, all of the things that you need to really build viability. But candidates always need to be able to also articulate why they want to run for office. And one way to start doing that is to talk about their personal stories. At EMILY's List, we've created a formula to help our candidates craft a compelling, relatable, and authentic personal story that explains why they're running. A personal story helps connect uh, and showcase the candidate's values by sharing their emotions, passions, and lived experiences that they will bring to the table as, a, as an elected official. Using a personal story that relates back to the democratic values allows them to be memorable and authentic while giving their audience the chance to get on board with their campaigns. Elected officials who are moving up the pipeline should govern and lead with their values. By doing so, they start to build their brand and they find their work through their policies. And when they decide to run for a partisan seat, they can point to their accomplishments as it relates to being a Democrat. While running on, uh, running on your record is important, you also have to run with support from a broad base of the community. Regardless of your nonpartisan office, candidates need to be able to, uh, be able to work on, with various communities and groups, but they also need to think about how their current position allows them to leverage their profile and build new relationships. Too often I see uh, local elected officials and nonpartisan seats move up to run for state legislative seats and have very little to no relationships outside their cities and counties. So it's necessary for women in local office to think about their next steps and not be afraid to build up because when they run for higher office, they need to scale up. At EMILY's List, we're committed more than ever to continue to build a bench with pro-choice democratic women. And I encourage anyone who's listening today and is interested in moving through the pipeline to sign up for our Run to Win program on our website at emilyslist.org. So thank you and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Johanna. That was a really great overview um, about transitioning from nonpartisan candidacy to partisan candidacy. Um, I did have a couple of questions for you, um, specifically kind of around fundraising too. You had, um, when do you think should a progressive candidate sort of meet and assess with consultants and fundraisers um, in advance of making a decision to run? You know, you mentioned that you should start early and timing is everything, but how early and how far in advance of announcing a candidacy should you discuss, should you talk with consultants and fundraisers? Yeah, I would say, you know, um, we, I would even back up and say, if you're an elected official in a nonpartisan seat, this is really an opportunity for you to build your individual donor base, right? This is what we as uh, campaign folks call the love money. So these are your friends, your community supporters who care about you, who support you. Um, and really start talking to them and really kind of exercising that call time muscle um, and calling them and asking them for their contribution, for a contribution and for their support. 
Um, obviously, when you're in local office, you know, local finance, local finance laws have to be taken into account that might restrict somebody from taking money from, let's say, a political action committee or even a corporation. Um, and additionally, there may be limits on how much you could raise, like there's a cap on how much you could raise or even the amount you can raise, for example, in local office is a lot lower than what you could raise in a state legislative office. So taking those things into account, it's really about building your base of donors at the local level. So when you're ready to move up to state legislative office, um, you don't start calling political action committees, you don't start calling major donors, you start calling your love money, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, people that you sit on nonprofit boards with. These are the folks, this is the early money that Emily's List talks about that creates viability so you can move on um, to talk to other donors who are gonna be even more invested in your campaign. That's great, thank you. Um, and we had a question here in the um, chat box. Um, okay. Johanna, what are some good first steps for a local elected to build statewide relationships? Could you provide a specific example or two? Sure. Um, I think definitely somebody who's in elected office should think through um, how they can work with other folks regionally, right? So who are the regional state representatives in Sacramento, for example? This is going to be key if you're looking at moving up to state legislature. Um, so building relationships with them through, you know, having coffees, uh, setting up meetings, thinking through um, are there things you're working on, you know, locally that maybe they're interested in and champion at the statewide level? Um, do you want to, you know, go up and maybe uh, speak on behalf of support of a bill that a state, legislat uh, state legislator is trying to advance? So thinking through the relationship building and expanding your base is uh, really key here. Um, but I think you have a great platform as, a, as an elected official in a nonpartisan seat to really build those relationships, but do it in a way that again is authentic. What do you care about? What are the things that you wanna see move in your community and, and um, who can help you do that? Yeah, wonderful. Um, there's also been sort of a, another question from the chat box, um, Johanna, is that there's been a criticism that women are too emotional and that that makes them back leaders. But, um, you specifically kind of mentioned that Emily's List encourages women to share their emotions and their passions through your personal story, creating your own narrative and, and sharing that story too. Um, have you at Emily's List kind of considered the power of females' emotions, whether that's helpful or detrimental, and how can we leverage that, our emotions, to make them a strength rather than being perceived as a weakness? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, yes, those perceptions are still out there and in many ways are barriers for us as women to be able to move, especially within the electoral um, pipeline. Uh, Barbara Lee Foundation, I would encourage all of you to visit the Barbara Lee Foundation website. They have a lot of um, uh, focus group information that they've done on how, yes, women's perception of being too emotional, um, or the gender bias has played into women getting elected. But I think for us, as we tell women, you know, uh, personal stories is really where you create a connection with voters about your values, right? Um, so this is the way that you start to define who you are. Um, I think we can think of many folks who talk about their personal story. Um, and if it, come, and it, you know, if it, it really shows how you have evolved through your career, it shows that you have had a situation, a moment that people can relate to, that you resolved that and that you did something about it, which is run for office. And so um, I think, yes, absolutely, these biases still exist and they're out there. But what we're finding is that when, pers when women share their personal story in a very authentic way, that allows them to lead with their values and connect to voters in a, in a, more, personal, in a more personal manner. Wonderful, thanks, that's really great advice too. And I know, um, you know, there's been lots of, in this current COVID situation, lots of memes kind of going around that are, you know, somewhat gender kind of playing on the, um, what a woman is doing versus what a man is doing in the current situation. So I know, you know, um, the advice from, from women and how we um, can leverage our emotions and our strengths as a passion, as truly as a passion, as an interest, as opposed to being seen as being, sort of shrill and weak is, is really powerful. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. So I think now we're going to transition to our next panelist, um, Jane Kim, the Honorable Jane Kim. And I'll let her start with the introduction of herself and then move on to some of the things that she wanted to focus on as well. Welcome, Jane. Oh, Jane, you're muted. We can't actually hear you. Okay. I, I didn't know how to unmute myself, but thank you, who, whoever unmuted me. Mm. Um, Pratima, thank you so much for moderating, also doing this while you're at work on the front lines yeah. of this pandemic. Um, just, I'll start with a brief intro of who I am and then move into the questions and the theme of today's panel. Um, I had the honor of serving as an elected official for 12 years here in the city and county of San Francisco. I first started out on the San Francisco Board of Education and then went on to run for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors where I served for eight years representing a district which included both the poorest residents of San Francisco and um, while I was in office soon to become the wealthiest zip code as well um, to really kind of highlight the incredible um, income and wealth gap that has grown here um, here in the Bay Area. Um, prior to that, I served as a community organizer for six years, working primarily with young people around issues of affordable housing, um, community planning, and transportation, and then also um, went on to law school uh, while I was serving on the Board of Education and um, briefly served as a civil rights attorney. Um, most recently, I served as the California political director for Senator Bernie Sanders and his um, race for president, um, 2020, and I'm continuing on to do some work um, in regards to some of the wrap up and, and the upcoming convention in August. Oh, and my bio is below. Um, Pratima, do you just want me to move on to these reflections? Um, yes, or did you want to start with the video? Uh, sure. As you wish. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. So we're just going to show something fun. Um, in my first race for state legislature, uh, we put out this ad um, in the primary, and we're just going to show you a little bit of what it can look like for a woman to run for state office. This is, by the way, outside my house <laughs> I don't think it's working well there's no audio on the video oh. Okay. Uh, that was an ad that my consultant had created um, in my race for state Senate. Um, I'll kind of go back to the reflections of running both locally um, and at the statewide level. As I mentioned, I started out running for the Board of Education and then the Board of Supervisors. Uh, on a certain level, there's a lot of similarities between both campaigns because the universe of voters that are voting for you may not vary very much. Um, I had run citywide prior um, for the Board of Education and the State Senate um, boundary lines was largely, um, it was the entire city of San Francisco and included a portion of San Mateo County as well. So there were new constituents that I was reaching out to, but largely it was um, voters that I was already familiar um, with doing outreach to and also had already and currently had been serving. So in terms of the field and all of the local endorsements, which continue to matter for state office, that part of the race remained largely the same. The added dynamic was actually what Johanna talked about was the dynamic of Sacramento. And it was really actually my first time spending a considerable amount of time in Sacramento. And I, you know, admittedly knew very little about the players. Um, luckily, Close the Gap had actually reached out to me about a year and a half or two years prior to the race to ask me to consider running for the seat. They um, go around identifying women um, to run for different state legislature seats. 
and had sat me through and had given me advice and also shared their list of contacts in Sacramento of people that I could reach out to, talk to, and just get to know. And so in the beginning before I declared, I went up to Sacramento probably every couple of weeks, which was very difficult to do when you're serving an office to kind of carve out an entire day um, to go up to Sacramento, just to sit down and have coffee with state legislators, lobbyists, fundraisers, um, statewide labor organizations, uh, like the one that Amber um, now heads, just to get a sense of that. And it is a, it's a much, much larger pond and uh, there's a lot of, a lot of folks to get to know and it can be intimidating and overwhelming um, but as you go through that process um, you get to know and build that network um, i probably started a little later than i should have um, in terms of building that network my opponent had started significantly earlier than i and there were certain advantages that particularly around endorsements and in fundraising um, and i think that is primarily one of the reasons why um, folks go up there um, in terms of the relevance of the state legislature, I spent a lot of time looking at it. It's not a body actually that many people are familiar with. In fact, I'm curious how many people even that are watching today know who their state representative is on the state assembly and the state senate. Um, they don't necessarily um, get as much media as your local representative. But what I will say is this, um, state legislatures across the country pass two to three times as many bills as Congress. In fact, on most issues that you care about or impact your everyday lives, um, or even around the top political issues that we could think about, um, access to reproductive health, um, sentencing reform, public education, even public health issues, most of those issues actually get decided by state legislatures. Um, part of my interest now is in um, figuring out how we can move Democrats, liberals, progressives, to have a greater focus on state legislatures. They really are one of the most important legislative bodies in our country today. And I think we're seeing that even more so highlighted in the current COVID-19 crisis, where um, there's somewhat of a lack of uh, uh, presence, I will say, from our, our national executive. And we're seeing our state executives really take the lead in terms of addressing this pandemic and also really serving our, um, you know, our everyday residents around guidelines and of course around resources as well. Um, I do think that Republicans and conservatives have done a very good job of building a pipeline into state legislatures. They're not as sexy, but they are the folks that are really doing the heavy lifting in the country today. Even around a lot of regulatory issues um, like the environment, it is states that are either taking the lead or not taking the lead because again, we are either seeing an action in DC or we're not um, getting the leadership that we need to see um, around combating one of the most important issues in our lifetime currently, which is combating climate change. So I really you know, implore this group to think about um, both running for state legislature, but also to think about how to pay more attention to it and how to organize around it. And also to think about what this body can do to impact um, changes down at the um, community level. Um, the next, I thought I would talk a little bit, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, running an outsider versus insider campaign. Um, I have traditionally run on the left spectrum of the Democratic Party. Um, I have run as a progressive. Um, in fact, in almost all of my races, I have not been endorsed by the party. Um, as a candidate when I ran for a Board of Education, Board of Supervisors, and the State Senate, um, I did not get the nod um, from the Democratic Party. Um, I was asked, you know, is there a strategy in terms of not seeking uh, the party endorsement? I do think it's always important to go out and seek the support of everyone when you're running, but to be honest and upfront of your values and what you're fighting for and why you're running. So don't pretend to be someone that you're not. But you should ask everyone for their support because you are the best candidate, because you are going to fight for your constituents, because you are smart, because you're passionate, because you know you're, you know, you really know um, what it takes to run and what it means to govern. Um, regardless of um, people's values, there is, um, there is, there is a, regardless of their principles, there is a value in terms of the character of the folks that they are supporting and also. Um, even if they don't always agree with you, 
they do want someone that they can work with and talk with. And that was always something that was important to me is that I had an open door. So even if you are not someone that may traditionally stand with me on policies, I will always meet with you. I will always sit down and listen. I'm always open to hearing different points of perspectives. And sometimes that is more important than um, what you have traditionally stood for and what you will continue to fight for. So I always think it's important to seek everyone's support. Um, that being said, if you don't get traditional establishment support, and I have not always gotten that in my race, um, there are um, there, there are important aspects to consider Then, how do you win, right? So there are ways that people have traditionally won office. And if you don't have those traditional resources like the party endorsement or your newspaper endorsement or the most money in the race, then there are other things that you need to think about. And I think one of the most important things that you should think about as you make that decision around running for office is, is who is your team? and what resources and skill sets do they bring to the table? And do they all as a cohort have what it takes so that we can together win this office? Great. Thank you, Jane. That, it was amazing advice and we really appreciate hearing from you, you know, as a, um, a true stalwart for all of us. And um, so I'm just gonna ask you a couple questions. We have one here from our chat box. Um, is how far in advance specifically do you suggest you start building relationships in Sacramento? And you mentioned that your opponent in the state Senate race got a much earlier start. So um, what is there, you know, specific people that you would recommend that we meet with shadowing a day? Would you ask a retired legislator? And how far in advance would you recommend that we do those? You know, I think it does vary uh, district by district. Um, there are certain districts um, where I think that's starting probably two years out is um, is incredibly important. So two years prior to that election day. Um, there are probably jurisdictions where um, you could you could have a lot less of a lead time a year um, before you run, even six months before you run. But I, I would say to be safe, I would at least start, um, if you can, a year or two before um, the actual election day um, to get started. Um, in terms of who you reach out to, I would certainly, if you can, reach out to your representative, um, ask to sit down with them. They live in your district and to ask for their advice, thoughts, and guidance. It's also helpful because they may play a really important role. This is actually, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm assuming that you're either not running for their seat against them um, or they are termed out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I do think it's important. That would be a little bit awkward, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little awkward if you plan on running against them to reach out to them. Uh, but A, they'll appreciate it that you reach out for their guidance and maybe they'll be helpful. Um, they'll certainly help. Um, they use, most folks, most electeds I find are pretty um, good about sharing. Um, some supporters or different consultants, lobbyists, um, community leaders, neighborhood leaders that you should sit down with. And always make it clear, it's not that you're asking for their endorsement. Um, but you just want to meet um, folks in their circle and meet the important um, players, both on the political level, but also at the neighborhood and community level. You really do want to make sure that you're reaching out to neighborhood leaders, um, to Democratic Party club leaders, um, to community leaders that whose vote you will actually be seeking. And then through there, you'll just find kind of a cascade, like literally a waterfall of individuals that you'll need to meet with. And in fact, you likely won't have enough time to meet with everyone that um, people suggest that you meet with. But in every meeting that you take, I would always ask at the end of the meeting, are there um, two to five different individuals that you think that I should sit down with next? Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. And just from a personal level, I also want, Jane has been a longtime mentor of mine in the political arena as well. So I want to express a personal um, moment of gratitude to you as well. So, um, Actually, I will say just one yeah. more thing if I can. Um, seeking mentorship is so important, whoever they might be. Um, in fact, there are a lot of academic studies on um, the importance of mentorship in universities and in graduate schools. Um, in law schools, for example, um, the law students that had at least one mentor, a professor usually, were more likely to become clerks um, with um, appellate judges, um, federal level um, judges. Uh, that mentorship 
is, is so important. I think largely for women and people of color and LGBTQ and also young folks, um, we have not always had that available to us, um, but reaching out and seeking any type of mentors um, will go a very long way. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, thanks. Um, and now we're going to move on to our final panelist, Amber Parrish Bauer. Thank you so much as well, Amber, for being here. I know you're as well on the front lines as we were all discussing too. And um, as Jane said, sorry, I didn't explain. Um, I'm a physician and I'm, I'm currently at work, which is what the mask is for too. I just came out of the operating room and um, continue to be in a clinical setting. So I need to persist with the mask. So um, Amber, let's, um, I'd love to hear from you. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, I've also had the privilege to work with both Jane and Johanna um, in the past, and just appreciate their support. And um, I, I just feel I just think the world of both of them. And um, thank you, Fatima, for joining us. Um, I, you know, I I am the executive director. I, I want to take a point of personal privilege and talk a little bit about leadership, and especially women in leadership positions, because I feel like Johanna and Jane just hit it so perfectly. I mean, um, you know, I'm the executive director of the United Food and Commercial Workers, um, the state's council, so California, Nevada, and Arizona. And it, we are uh, like uh, not quite as much as Pratima, who has um, hopefully all of her PPE and she is in a clinical setting. We have workers who are in the grocery stores and seeing hundreds of people a day um, and are really on the front lines right now. So I just want to acknowledge that and say, um, I know that we all are trying to do the best we can in this um, situation. And uh, it's really nice to be able to talk about um, kind of the future and how and how we're going to look at elections. And I know everything's changing. And it, it this this conversation is so grounding in that um, it really ha I really have spent my career looking at ways um, to kind of uh, to recruit candidates and, and move them from the kind of um, nonpartisan offices into um, higher office. So just. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here for that. And I will say like the vision of leadership has really changed and has compelled me my entire career. I started off working for um, a woman. I was in grad school and I thought, I was thinking I would go into, um, I wanted to get my PhD. And I thought, well, you know, I've been in school and I haven't really done a, a campaign and maybe it makes sense that I should volunteer and spend some time thinking about what, or look, um, seeing what it looks like to run for office. So at the time, um, I'm going to bring up some names some of you may know, but I um, went to uh, Assemblymember Pat Wiggins' office, and she was being termed out, and I sat down with her um, district director and said, like, I wanted to volunteer in some way, and she said, well, there's a woman running um, for her office named Noreen Evans, so maybe you should, she directed me over to her office, so I went there. Uh, to her tiny campaign office and met with her. Um, and she she was like, yes, we'd love to have you. And halfway through the interview, the campaign manager at the time came in and said, I quit and walked out. <laughs> I was like, she said, actually, do you want a job? Do you want to like come in and like, um, I'll pay you and you can work for a campaign. So I did. And that's how I started. And Noreen was um, a city council member at the time. And so really started there from the very beginning and started working um, with her and, and all of the steps that I think both Jane and Johanna said, I mean, starting or she had started early. Um, it wasn't the time of top two, but she had a challenger um, who was another Democrat. And so uh, we really knew this, 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 uh, this, uh, race would be decided in the primary, um, made those connections that both Johanna and Jane talked about, um, found a, a fundraiser, it's so incredibly important. And you really do run two campaigns, as I think both of you know, you run a campaign in the district, and then you run a campaign in Sacramento. And um, in many ways, because it was two Democrats, um, getting that institutional support from other Dems in, in um, the uh, legislature was incredibly important. And I think uh, everyone in and those days, and I think now too with top two, you're trying to hedge your bets. Like you wanna you wanna put your money behind the right one, right candidate and um, leadership is looking at like what are the dynamics like and um, me like especially now we're always looking for the, the most progressive um, person that we think we can get behind and really build support even if they're not the front runner so in, in some in many ways that that race kind of shaped um, how I approach elections now um, and she did get um, the speaker of the assembly at the time um, that that um, support and that really started to build the momentum and campaign manager um, getting somebody who was really um, uh, visionary I think in that way and, and really understood the, the Sacramento game because Noreen did not at the time and so I think uh, she, you know we both learned together and I became her district director and ran a lot of campaigns um, uh, she was chair of the Democratic caucus so I spent a lot of time around the state working on campaigns 
So that said, I mean, I, I think when I look at um, when I look at other races that I've worked on, um, many of you, you know, we worked in the Inland Empire um, and supported Eloise um, Gomez Reyes, who is um, a wonderful candidate. And I think so much of it, you know, starting early in that candidate recruitment was really incredibly important. And then also finding someone that really matched the values of the district, incredibly important also, like very progressive, very working class, um, very democratic. Uh, and at the time they had a really moderate assembly member. And so um, for me, that was, that was really the way, um, and then building that partisanship and then building the Sacramento game um, was the way we were successful in that. Um, and I just want to speak a little bit about um, kind of the moderate versus the progressive, because I think we all mentioned it a little bit, but um, I just, just to put a fine point on it, I mean, many of my I think uh, my mentor, Jim Araby, who had this job before me, often says, like, we don't, UFCW doesn't have a lot of issues, but our issues are sometimes really tough. So we're not asking um, uh, elected to, to vote on everything, but we are asking a, a, a couple hard votes. And so for me, when I look at the, it's those issues that really, uh, as to have so many Democrats um, in in the legislature, it's, it's finding those issues that I think we really, uh, we find that some Democrats really struggle with, and that's and that's usually our hard line. And some of those are, um, you know, la like real labor issues. Charter schools is one that comes to mind. Um, cannabis for us, so we represent workers in cannabis. And um, I think generally, Democrat, uh, most Democratic elected officials support cannabis, but for us, it's um, a bad employer is a bad employer, and there's some bad employers in cannabis. And so holding that standard really high um, around a labor peace agreement, and once you get into those I mean we're seeing it now in the COVID-19 era and that um, you know I, I think when we go back into session uh, some of these issues that protect um, workers and extend yesterday we were able to get um, 14 days of paid sick leave for every worker in the food chain and huge I mean that was a huge thing and I think that really that really sets um, the tone, I hope, for um, the legislature when we get back into session to say that workers deserve, uh, even work, uh, workers like like we represent, grocery store workers, and, and so many others that are very vulnerable, deserve our highest um, protection. And, and I think, I, I hope that the state will step in and do that. Um, and again, that's why I think this conversation is so incredibly important because I know um, you all are really interested in seeing what we can do in that space. And I hope you all run and I'd love to support you. And mentorship, again, as Jane said, is so critical, um, especially for women. And I think, um, you know, different ways to lead has been really important for me as a woman in labor um, to, to see different examples of leadership that's not always just really strong and resolute, but like sensitive and vulnerable and, you know, like finding ways, compassion led, like, it, you know, I don't want to go too much into gender norms because of course we're all on the spectrum but for me that's where I'm most comfortable and so and so it, it has been um, transformational for me to be able to see leadership in that way um, that I can then aspire to yeah well thank you Amber um, I uh, really have learned so much from you and I beg to differ I think your um, all the staff that you're working with too are even more on the front lines they're getting exposed to way more more people than I am too. And none of us could be here if it wasn't for them too. So thank you for all you're doing. And it's great news to hear that they are getting their well-deserved and needed um, paid sick leave too. So thank you for that. Um, they, I wanted, did want to ask you a question though about if you could talk a little bit um, around viability and the importance of viability when seeking a union endorsement or other organizational endorsements. For example, like what do you at UFCW look for specifically when a candidate comes to you? in terms of their other endorsements, their fundraising sort of thing too? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question because viability is often used to block candidates out of the race. And so, you know, it's some, sometimes viability is used to really um, winnow in on the on the kind of institutional candidate, I will say that. So I, uh, you know, viable for me um, is, it, it, can mean many things. Some of it is money and potential to fundraise. I mean, obviously, we all know you have to be able to raise the the, the real money to run a campaign. There's really a it's hard to come from the outside and not do that. But for me, it's uh, I think Jane mentioned it too. Is like um, it 
I mean, you have to be true to your values. And let me just say, I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds of candidates and you can tell right away if someone's trying to, to kind of um, angle for an endorsement, I, I, that does not work. Um, you can't come in to a union and say, um, my grandfather was a teamster and kind of like try to make this, I just say that because I, I work for the labor council and everyone <laughs> always does that. But there has to be a real connection to the values of labor. Yeah, and that alone does not give you the endorsement, yeah. It doesn't. I mean, I appreciate it because my parents come from union and that's why I'm here. But there really does have to be um, either you're there or you're not. And, you know, uh, it's sometimes we stay out of races because, um, you know, we have two friends running against each other. But I would say it's like it is that authenticity um, and, a, and a commitment and also acknowledgement. Like I, I have to raise a lot of money. Like I, I fully understand that. I, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to get how I'm going to get there. Uh, and then I and then I can help like it, to be honest, like I don't really understand how I know how much money it takes. Um, but I, I'm not sure how to get there. And then I would introduce them to people like Johanna, who uh, we often will um, check in with each other and say, I have an amazing candidate, but like we need some development there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. But it is it, viability is a tricky thing. And um, it, it, so, so much of it is a, a vision and being able to build on policies and and to really have um, unique experience with they they and they see have a vision of how to leverage that into an elected position. Like I look for that and I totally look for someone um, that's that like I want to work with and I'm excited about I mean that that really that connection to people in a real way and that um, that live their values and that's, and that's yeah. Great, I, I Great. totally agree. I mean, I think that Jane, I think, I think it was Johanna you had mentioned yeah, just Johanna. the importance of being true to your um, True to your values and true to yourself too and I think that that applies when you're seeking an endorsement when you're kind of creating your platform, when you're learning about the issues that are important to your constituents too, because I think if you're not true to yourself, then you've just sort of totally lost things. Um, so I wanted to kind of just ask some general questions of all of you too. So we'll just start with, you know, um, sort of in one or two sentences, what comes to your mind first um, when you hear that a school board candidate or a city council member is running for state legislator? We'll start with you, Johanna. Um, well, I'm very excited because, you know, that's <laughs> our work, right? I think all of us would be equally yeah. excited to hear that somebody wants to wants to run. You know, our um, our president of Emily's List, Stephanie Shriok, always says the bravest thing you can do is put your name on the ballot, right, and run. And so um, I think, uh, you know, yes, definitely be on the excitement of having that person do that. I think looking at what resources are available for them, right? I think all of us, you know, Jane and Amber have spoken about the importance of mentorship, the importance of really helping women um, step up. And so I think if they would come to Emily's list for sure, uh, you know, we help train them, we help really build their campaigns from the ground up. Um, so it isn't just about fundraising, it's about staffing up, what type of staff, when you should staff up, who are the priority staff that you need to have for us. It's always a finance person who you should hire first, because again, you have to raise the money. Um, and then also, you know, the big thing that I always tell women is, I don't want you to worry about, you know, I don't have a big Rolodex. I don't know a lot of people. Um, we can help build that for you, right? I want to know, are you willing to put in the time? Are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to do the long hours that it's going to take to win a campaign? I will teach you and train you, but I need to know that you're there 100%. And so that's a big part of it. Um, the other piece also that I always mention to women is don't worry about the 20 things you don't know. Women are very hard on themselves when it comes to running for office that they need to know every policy issue before they even decide that they want to run. I always say to them, put a kitchen cabinet together, go and talk to Amber about unions, right? Go and talk to Jane about what's happening at the local level or even regionally in the Bay Area around certain issues. But don't stop yourself from not running because you feel that you are not qualified enough. It does get to this point about electability. And for us, um, all women are electable. I think, you know, we wanna recruit in non-traditional places. You know, I wanna know who's that union leader that Amber's been working with for the last year that we should start working with and getting her to run. Uh, equally, I wanna know who's the rising star in a local county or city that um, has been doing amazing work and she needs to run for one of these seats that are coming up in the state legislature. So for us, it's really about, I just need you to do the work and we can put together a team for you that's gonna get you into a place of viability. 
great. That's a really good point. Um, what about you, Jane? What would you say? Would you say that you hear? Like what, what, what comes to mind when you hear that a school board member or a city council member is running for state legislator? I think my response is the same as Johanna. I think all of us, um, I'm just very excited when anyone is interested in running A for office and of course is interested in the state legislature. Um, and I certainly, for any school board members out there, there is so much that needs to happen at the state level around public education. It is a third of our state budget, but it's not a third of the time of what state legislators spent their time working on, which is incredibly important because it's one of the most important social safety net infrastructure that we have to um, make California an incredibly um, productive but also equitable state. And so um, I do really think that we need education leaders to run for office um, and be in Sacramento because I don't see strong voices on public education up there. Um, but what I look for when I sit down with candidates, actually the number one um, most important factor in me determining your viability is not how much money you have or how many endorsements you have, it is how hard you are willing to work. Um, in every single race that I have seen, um, a hardworking candidate, it's, it's like a 10 point edge. I, I, I can't put a numerical number to it, but your likelihood or possibility of even winning um, office is really determinate, I think, largely on how hard you are willing to work. Second, of course, is the team that you bring to the table because no one ever wins office by themselves. So the second question I always ask is who is on your team? In many cases, in the traditional sense, it's you know your consultant, your campaign manager, your field director, your fundraiser. Um, you know, I think it varies again, race by race, whether you have to have all of those things. And certainly in the last couple of years, we're seeing an increasing number of candidates say that they are, um, you know, gonna run without a consultant, run without a pollster. I think that's a nice tagline to be honest, but I think that there has to be a really good reason behind that. You're still gonna need different individuals to do all of those things whether it's to create the ad, like the one that you saw earlier today that my consultant created, to design and build out your mailer, to be able to figure out the universe of voters that they're targeted to, and to figure out how that targeting happens. Um, I think that, you know, pollster consultant has kind of a, a bad rep um, in these days in the political world, but I really think it's not about what their title is, it's who they are who you are bringing to the table. Do you trust them? Do they have your back? Are they good people with good values that understand who you are and what you are fighting for? And do they share that, right? I think that is way more important than whether they're a consultant or not a consultant because they'll ultimately be doing the same thing for you. And, and you wanna make sure that they're effective at doing that work, particularly if you're a woman, a person of color, young, LGBT, um, there are definitely consultants out there that are not used to working for or with those types of candidates. And um, you got to really trust everyone on your team, like really, really trust them. And the campaigns that I've seen that are not successful or that have fallen apart are campaigns where the candidate does not trust everyone on their team. It just does not work. You do not have the time or the emotional bandwidth to manage and work um, intimately with people that you don't trust. Um, ultimately, I think that that is a formula for losing um, races that I've seen very good candidates lose races because they don't have a good team or they don't trust their team, whether they're good or not. Um, the third, I mean, after all of that, then I kind of ask about who's your support base? Who are your endorsers? How much money have you raised? Um, money is incredibly important. I'm not, I, I think that Amber and Joanna has mentioned that, but I don't think that it's the only or the most important factor. I think there are ways to surmount that, but you definitely do need resources to be able to put all of these different um, aspects, apparatus of a campaign out. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit for you, Amber, too, because I know that I think Johanna and Jane. Um, uh, so can you maybe talk a little bit about the practice of women feeling like they need to wait their turn before they run for office? I just wanna kind sure. of get to some more of the questions from the general, yeah. um, from the yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah, too, yeah. Right? yeah. 
I will just say if, if a candidate say, comes to me and says they're running and says they're probably not doing my job and that I want to find people who are interested in running and recruit them and, and like push them forward. So if someone came out of the blue and said, hey, I want to run for office, I'd be like, oh, how'd I miss you, you know? Um, so I will say, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it that's a real thing. And, and often I think, um, you know, I can't, I can't quite remember the statistics, but probably one of you can, is that like women, some, when we when we run and we lose, which happened in my, the first candidate I, I um, worked for, Noreen, she lost the um, County Board of Supervisors race. They, like nobody like goes back to that. Like it's very rare to go back and say, can you run again? Um, and that they feel like they can't run, they don't wanna run again, or they shouldn't run again. Like they had their turn and they didn't win and they should just go back into something else. And I think for me, it's like, it's just about, yeah, this is some. It's sometimes it's really, really hard, um, and we need to ask women to run. And that is so. It's such a different mindset than um, often when we have other male candidates, and they're like, "I'm going to run," and then people kind of they they you know we we help them build the campaign. But for women, they have to be asked, and that is a real thing. Um, I will say, even coming into this position, like I did not see myself in this role. I was really a political director who did the work, and executive director I, I just wasn't as comfortable with. And so I had to be asked, like, and and told you are ready and you can do this and that actually changed my mindset um and you know hopefully it's not going to be like that you know for my daughter and other people who are coming up um through the world but for me it for sure is and i know that like even if i fail i need someone to come back and say hey let's let's do it again are you up for it let's like go back and see what else where else we can put you and what else we can run for and i know johanna and i have done have had that discussion and um both i'm sure have done it where we said okay that didn't work um so then what else can you run for where where else like don't just give up like let's try to find and sometimes you need that space and sometimes it's a year sometimes it's 10 years and you'll come back to it but um i think it's really important that when you invest in someone and they've invested in you that you we keep that relationship and you try to um you know move it forward and uh i have tried to do that for sure uh and said you know okay let's let's like um let's take a break and then let's like re-strategize and see where we can go from here yeah you um you, i think it's they say that if a woman runs for office and she doesn't win she says what's wrong with me and if a man runs for office mm -hmm. and he doesn't win he says what's wrong with the voters is kind of like what you know um, one of the uh, the old sort of jokes about it too. Um, so, um, Johan, I wanted to ask you um, the um, do you can you talk a little bit um, about addressing the importance of sort of assessing a race prior to making a decision um, to run and the importance of sort of assessing that race and your success in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, when you're thinking about running and making that and trying to make that decision, it's important to look at, you know, what seats are coming up, right? What are the seats that are available to you um, in terms of um, any open seats potentially challenging somebody? These are the things that you also have to weigh in, right? Do you go after an open seat or do you want to challenge someone? But um, one of the things that even prior to that is, I would say, take a step back and think about why you want to run, right? What do you want to bring to the table? What are the things that you want to work on? What are you passionate about? Um, because this is going to be, I mean, we've all heard authenticity, you know, at this panel many times, and that's real. Voters can um, can detect that. And so being able to be authentic, because that's really going to drive you in the long haul to do the hard work, right? You're gonna have to really, really be passionate about what you're doing because there's gonna be a lot of tough days when you're running for office and there's gonna be a lot of really good days. And so at the end though, what you wanna see is that you wanna champion a particular issue, you wanna champion a particular cause. So once you've determined why you wanna run, then you start doing your homework. What, what's the seat that's available? How many votes do I need to get? Who are the folks that are players within that district um, that I need to start having coffees and meeting with? Earlier in my introduction, I talked about the importance of expanding your, um, your network, right? That's not just for women in nonpartisan seats, that's for any woman who's thinking about running for office. The last thing that you wanna do, as Amber pointed, is saying, um, I'm now running, I'm gonna go to Amber and get her endorsement. If you know that Amber and the UFCW are an important and key endorsement to get, then you need to start building early relationships with them. What is it that you can help them champion? What do you want to work on with them, right? And so, and then when it is time for you to run, 
you can, you know, seek an endorsement in a very authentic and real way. Um, and so, but that's the case with anybody. So really start expanding your network. And where, or the folks, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, so where, since you're, you know, you're fundraising with, I mean, your work with Emily's list, where in this pathway would you say you should bring on a fundraiser if and when, or bring on a consultant? Yeah, we always advise, I mean, I know it's a very California culture in campaigns to bring on a general consultant immediately when you start. Our advice is always bring on a finance director immediately when you start, because you need to start raising the money, right? And again, I know that, you know, um, we've all talked about there is a there is a formula to viability. It is not just about money, but you need to raise that early money in order to be able to get more money. This is, it's in our name, right? Early money is like yeast, it makes the dough rise. And so having, hiring a finance director first to start doing call time, to do research on who's giving, to help you organize your lists, to give you, know, give you advice on who and how to make a pitch, the, this is what's really going to be key for you. And then you can start building staff. As Jane said, every race is different. You don't need to have a field person, a general consultant, this person, that person. It all depends on the scale of your race. Um, but definitely, at minimum, we always advise bring in a finance advisor first. Great. Thanks. Um, so Jane, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, you mentioned you ran as kind of, you know, progressive and what are some of the critical progressive constituencies that a candidate should hope to have and how do you learn about the issues that are most important to them? Um, sorry, the second question is a little difficult for me because I feel like you, if you're running, you should already know the issues that are important. Um, to the constituents that you are running for and that frankly you should have already worked on those issues. Uh, the one thing, and, and this is my bias um, as I say this, I also really seek people that have where their work experience or their history demonstrates their commitment. So it's not enough to say I'm a progressive, these are my values, but you look to what they've done already. Um, you want a demonstrated record and it doesn't mean that um, you devoted your life as a union organizer or as a nonprofit worker, that would be ideal. But I also understand that not everyone has the financial ability per se to make certain sacrifices. And maybe there are other opportunities that are afforded to them and they need to take those opportunities um, for their family, um, for a number of other reasons. But even in your, in your non-work space, like how have you spent that time? Are you in the community? Are you going to community neighborhood meetings? Do you already know the issues? Um, I don't think that someone should have to educate you about what those issues are that people care about. Um, so I, I'll just start off by saying that. Um, the, first, the first part of your question, Pratima, could you repeat that about being a progressive? Yeah, um, just more about how you identify what are your progressive constituencies and sort of, um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think actually in many ways since 2016, um, and, and since certainly my, my current employer um, first ran for office, we are seeing a lot more um, groups that have been forming, both locally and at the statewide level, um, that, that want to support uh, progressive candidates electorally. You have the, the DSAs, uh, the Democrat Socialists of America, as you have um, uh, the Bernie Kratz. Now you have Sunrise Movement, which is really starting to flex. Um, here in the state of California, you have a strong network of grassroots organizations that have started 501c4s tables. So maybe there's the um, Inland Empire table, if that's where you're at, or here in San Francisco Bay Area, there's Bay Rising. Um, and these are the groups that you want to reach out to. You'll also see different progressive democratic clubs um, in the variety of cities um, or regions that you're in. Here in San Francisco, there's a Harvey Milk LGBTQ Democratic Club, and you definitely want to sit down with members and leadership there. Um, union and labor, as Amber had mentioned, you want to build out and develop that, uh, those relationships. The one thing I will say is, even if you have not decided to run for office, is to start building that network now. Um, not, not just to prepare to run for office, but actually because it, it fits within your value structure anyway, and you want to be in the work of making change. Um, I do want more people to run for office, but running for office isn't the only way um, to make that change. So regardless, this network is going to be incredibly valuable to you as you go to seek um, to make a difference for your community. 
And even if you're just running kind of a local campaign um, for a budgetary request at the Board of Education or at your city council, or whether you're fighting for additional affordable housing units in a new construction project that's coming um, to your um, region, um, this network is gonna be so important for you to always have ready to go. Um, so it's never a waste of time to build this network. And what I've always said is that, you know, it is always important to follow whatever your true north is, but it's even more important to be able to surround yourself with people that share your true north and share your values, because that is always going to be able to augment um, the power that you can build to make um, change and hopefully everlasting change for your community and neighborhood. So definitely seek those out. And like I said, all you need to do is connect with one person. Um, in a community that will immediately open up doors because they'll then introduce you to five more who will you know that each of those folks will introduce to five more attend those happy hours um, attend those community meetings uh your the door will really open up very wide and you may find multiple different avenues um, to make a difference um, including hopefully running for office thank you um, well, um, so it's unfortunately one o'clock and I want to be sensitive because I know everybody has many demands on their time. So I just really want to thank you as our panelists. We really appreciate you all taking the time. Thank you for all the participants too. Um, you know, I think it was really wonderful. We learned today the importance of being true to yourself and creating your personal story, um, the importance of mentorship. And I think a really important part of your team, hiring, a, you know, bringing on a really good team and good staff and making sure that everybody's willing to pitch in together and work hard. Um, and building relationships and how they're going to really help transition you when you're running for partisan office and the importance of timing too. Um, I just want to also say, you know, if you want to learn any more information about Close the Gap California, you can check us out. Our website is closethegapcalifornia.org and this webinar will be recorded and be posted there next week. Um, we're a completely volunteer powered campaign and getting to 50% our mother load like we talked about. Um, it's going to be a list. So if you'll sign up for our email alert, volunteer, consider donating, following us on social media, we would appreciate any of those. And I just want to encourage everybody finally to stay safe, stay healthy together. You know, so we as women leaders, um, we can and will run for office. We will succeed. We'll help mitigate through this crisis and achieve gender parity. And um, women are definitely being unfairly affected by this crisis. They're um, unduly uh, targeted in the um, being in the service industry work. So, you know, if and you're if and you're willing and able to reach out to your stylist, to your manicurist, to your babysitter, to your house cleaner, and see how they're doing. You know, um, see if they need anything. You know, even just Venmoing them a little something. Can, and if we all as a community can do that and do that together, we can help get through this together. So, thank you, everyone. <laughs>